just for people, I don't know how many of you have seen the exhibition um, already or not, but I, I just, we have a couple images I just okay. from my phone that we could show up for people who haven't. Maybe we can pull those up um, just to give some examples of what's, uh, what's going on. When we, when we conceived the show, we decided to, to avoid doing a chronological uh, look at music video, and rather, if music videos like feature films had genres, what would those be? And, uh, and that's where the nine sections came about. And I think that's when we really, the creative collaboration with Alex came, came, to, came to be is really how best to um, exhibit <laughs> videos which are regularly available on YouTube. Like we wanted to make something really special and, and kind of immerse people in what it would be like if you could enter into a music video. Um, We're huge admirers of Alex's work. And so when um, the opportunity came up, we approached him and asked him if he would want to work with us on conceiving the idea for bringing you know, a music video exhibition to life. And he very kindly rose to the challenge and was as passionate about it as we were. Well, from my, from my end, it was a sort of a dream come true. As a filmmaker, it's, it's a really amazing opportunity to actually work with the medium of music video from the point of view of an outsider or a curator, not from the inside out. Because the first thing that we discovered right away was the lack of, uh, the, lack of um, the materials that actually went into the making of a particular piece. Information. Because a lot of people... Information, right? It's like in artifact. information and artifacts. Right, yeah. because as, you know, as, this, as filmmaking is such a results-oriented um, medium. I think it's, for, the, for most of the directors, it's really not that important to keep the, uh, the work in progress, you know, the tests and sketches and things like that. So a lot of the stuff is lost, as we've discovered. And the stuff that's missing could really be the most interesting part, right? Mm. So the stuff that we were able to find was, you know, maybe early storyboards or um, things that May have, may have not been the most important, you know, uh, aspects of, of the making of. But I think Alex but is downplaying really his vision because we knew that we wanted it to be immersive and we knew that we didn't want a screen on wall um, presentation where it's just the traditional, certainly you can't get away from the presentation of videos with screens and headphones, but right. we wanted to make it immersive and Alex just went crazy with great ideas. I mean, it's a real credit to, your, to you, Alexi, that the design has worked in, this is the fourth, um, the fourth institution that the that Spectacle has, has, has been in. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing how the, the show was um, formed and uh, realigned with different types of buildings. But I wanted yeah. to ask about the conversation between the three of you, uh, collating the content and then dividing it into thematic mm -hmm. sections. How did that work? Did the content come first? Did the discussion come first? And did it sort of snowball? Or how, how did that actually work? Well, I think the content obviously came first. But Jonathan, do you want to yeah, talk mean, about that a little bit? I think bit? once, we, once we, we found these genres, we, we, we were able to build out, I mean, we kind of sought out additional works that would fit within those um, sections, and um, and specifically a section like Agent Provocateur, which is all about the most controversial videos. Mm -hmm. And Alex, we came up with this idea of challenging how people would actually watch them, and, and they have to look through a peephole in kind of a red light district. Um, Very so sleazy. <laughs> the entire exhibition, I think, is a challenge of the physicality of the space because you really have to first you have to get lost in it. It's a little bit of a music video wonderland, you know. And it's also not chronological and there's many different paths. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure, where am I gonna end up sort of experience. And that was intentional because I think that with music videos, you don't know what you're gonna get, where you're gonna go, or how far the creativity can go. And, and we wanted to have that same, uh, or we aspired to have that same uh, approach to the design of the space and the experience really that people have and um, one of the things that was really important to us was for people to be able to interact with the objects and the things that they were seeing not just be 
looking at it, but to really be part of it. And so um, here at Acme, it's spectacle is the first show they've ever had where photography is allowed. So that's we're really excited about that. <laughs> I just I just want to add that we're we were trying to avoid any sort of hierarchy in presenting different genres or different school schools of thought. Mm, and that absolutely comes through. And I I really enjoy the way that Jonathan and Meg talk about the show as being a it's possible to have a, a social interaction with uh, moving image in a different way or interact with music video in, in a very kind of social way, which is something that, um, that we're really excited about here at ACME. I wanted to speak a, a little bit about collaboration because as we know, Flux is a creative community or described as a creative community. Um, Al Alexi and, and Logan as a, as a, a co-founder uh, of that, um, I guess, organisation. And, and so collaboration really sits at the heart of what you all do. And I think um, Chris, Darcy, Josh and Lucy, you've all worked to some extent really closely with, with the musicians. Um, that we've seen that today, particularly in your um, behind the scenes video there at Oh Yeah Wow. Do you want to talk about Oh Yeah Wow Studio um, in any more about that, about how you work together or um, bully each other or? Sure. Um, for, first, I have to <coughs> apologize for subjecting you to that video. Josh just was adamant about showing it. I thought it would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't want to show it. Um, but uh, I guess Oh Yeah Wow has been born out of, um, I guess, just, just friendship, really, as, as lame as that sounds. Um, we're all just really, really tight friends and really enjoyed making um, stuff together. And it's kind of a, just a collective posse of people who really, really, really wanted to make kind of cutting edge stuff. Um, and we just figured that we're kind of stronger to get that alone. The collaboration also makes the project stronger because if you're around the people when the uh, pitch comes in, it's like best idea wins and then they direct it. So it's not yeah. really farmed out to any specific people when a project comes in, it kind of is shared around and then you know, if everyone likes your idea the best, then you get to direct it. So. Yeah, and we kind of we're, we're very collaborative when a, when a job comes in as well. So if we do have a good idea, everyone kind of injects their own creativity mm -hmm. into it. And um, before you know it, you've got a you've got a video that's tenfold yeah. better than it was. Just so you're not like a lonely entity, kind of just wondering if you're getting it right. Takes a village. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, we saw you subject Grizzly Bear to um, hours and hours of torture via silicon and plaster casts, etc. Um, I mean, that that is a huge uh, taxing process, no doubt for the band. Um, can you talk a little bit about your work with Grizzly Bear, particularly? Um, yeah, well, the the first video we did, uh, you know, that expression like you know, um, blood, sweat, and tears. You know, you you extract, you know so much or you you kind of put so much effort into something you're kind of willing to bleed for it well we had chris taylor literally bleed in the video by having a nurse on standby uh with a syringe so I, yeah that's so cruel <laughs> well <laughs> what what's cruel of what, what what ended up being unintentionally cruel about that moment is um my my card was full my my, my camera card was full uh, <laughs> when we did the first round, when we did the first take. And um, <laughs> yeah, we have to do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrific. <Yeah. laughs> but, but I mean, like, you know, these guys w were up for it. You know, like, I, I briefed them beforehand. Like, in order for us to do what we did, they had to be okay with it up front. So, um, you know, the funny thing was is uh, we had like the uh, uh, an editor, uh, a, a writer, sorry, from uh, the New York magazine doing a six-page article on them, uh, and they f and he followed them around even to the location where we set we we set this video uh, for Gunshy, which was actually Chris Taylor's uh, upstate New York, you know, second home, um, and. He he was listen. He was kind of asking questions about you know previous experiences the bands had, and you know they were like you know <coughs> nothing is as bad as the video like that they did for Knife, which was um, by Encyclopedia Pictura. There's a, a scene where they're being slowly lowered into quicksand, and the reality of that shot was they were in a a used dumpster. Being, being like leveled down, you know, by a pallet connected to rope, you know, manned by four guys, you know, and they had to kind of maintain balance and they were just like, th that was a, a, you know, really the glamorous life of the musician. So they were like, you know, 
give us a syringe, we'll, we'll bleed for this, you know, because <laughs> nothing's going to be as bad as that. <laughs> And I guess the opposite of, of the, the intensity of that relationship and that process might be something that you, you sort of looked at, Lucy. And I, I'm really interested in, in the drawings and sketches that you did. In the exhibition, um, we have Dougal Wilson's um, sketchbooks, which are equally um, detailed and beautiful renders of sort of a frame by frame. And I guess I'm interested in, um, is, that, is that your process how has it been to date and, and is that the, what you go to first? Is that how you start? Or? Um, it, it changes all the time depending on the project. But um, I mean, I, I really love being able to just um, throw all sorts of chaotic situations. Um, ideally, that's the process that I like the most. I feel like you come up with a lot more crazy surprises. and um, But, you know, sometimes you really have to think it out. And I do like, it, if it's really um, something I'm really excited about, I will, like, draw it out and sketch it out. And then um, you sort of feel very prepared. But then I sort of, like, throw it away and then also see on the day, like, what might come your way and, you know, what other um, opportunities show themselves. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's another clip that I did, which is one of my first clips for Donny Benet, which was... Um, the sort of like this ambiguous comedic thing of these two um, groups of two guys and two girls and the artist um, was driving a like this Pontiac um, that was sort of like night, the night Rider car and um, we, we had to drive down the beach to film this scene and um, we were running really late and I was, you know, trying to get um, everything shot within the the daylight and um he was such a trooper like i i called him and it was, we were all in this like car convoy and we we're like i was like to the guys in the car i was like can you see can you see the um donny anywhere and um whose real name's actually ben warples but um anyway and um i called him and um he was just like no the brakes have actually failed on the, the <coughs> night rider car and um but uh yeah so he he was um really great to collaborate with like he was very trusting um would let me do anything like i just was i was like you know tell him to do this to him and to do that and he'd never um you know flinch he'd just be like down with it but i do find that sometimes like a lot of the younger artists can be quite self-conscious and yeah i think in those ways you have to be a little bit more prepared and sort of show them what you're thinking sometimes. But, yeah, I guess it's um, something that I'm always working out and it's sort of um, specific to each um, band and, yeah. Yeah. And, and what about for you guys, Josh and Darcy, do you – how much – I mean, I, I guess as, as Lucy said, you need the structure to break it apart and find the abstraction and, and find those little shiny moments. Do you, do you work in a similar way or, or is it – how, what's beside the animation that you do, for example, with your collaborations with Gautier, et cetera. So do you, do you want to talk about your process in, in that regard? Sorry, just to clarify, what processing, sorry, what regard? So, so <laughs> we're, we're making the video and where you're talking with a band, or like Beg is a great example. Yeah, yeah. So um, are you thinking frame by frame? Um, I mean, obviously in post it's absolutely specific. Yeah. But before that, how, how tightly structured is this process? I, I guess the interesting thing about Oh Yeah Wow is that we all started out as animators and that's all we did. We did claymation. I worked on Mary and Max, which is a feature film from Animalia, and I was a lead sculptor. And that's the background we all came from. We all come through um, RMIT and animation kind of schooling there. And um, live action music videos was actually something we only kind of really got into um, post the success of the Gautier clip that we had. Um, we just got inundated with uh, treatments and, and call outs. And, thus had to try and find a way to make um, clips a lot faster because the gotcha clip took us nine months to make. Um, and so it was just mental, we couldn't be doing that um, time after time. So we ended up teaching ourselves live action filmmaking in essence and we, we started learning the ropes of that which was just trial by fire. Um, and with the Bombay Bicycle Club clip, um, I think uh, Shelley was saying it's the, it's the cheapest film clip in the entire exhibition. <laughs> it was made for a budget of a thousand dollars and we actually had to shoot it three times um, due, to, due to a whole series of kind of unforeseen events but um, we learnt a lot on a shoot like that and we put our, our lead dancers through absolute hell um, we had them pretty much naked on the train going home and they were dancing through the city naked that was after the video Sorry? That was after the video. No, that was part, that was part of the video as well. They were just in underpants on the train. And, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. That's a joke. Sorry. Yeah, it was, after, it was after party, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try the video. Like a madhouse. <laughs> Rat party. 
but um, you know, we, we put we put a lot of our, our actors and our musicians through hell as well. Um, funnily enough, with the with the the um, silicon stuff, we had a clip for British India where we had a Minotaur mask made, and we had our, our lead Minotaur. The guy in the Minotaur suit was just freaking out because he couldn't get this thing off his neck; it was glued to his neck, and he was just freaking out. It was so claustrophobic, and we'd we'd shot a short film with it the first day, and then we we're shooting the clip the second day, and overnight, um, it couldn't come off. We had to sleep in it. And it had this really rigid kind of um, spinal thing that kind of kept his head upright. And he was just like, I want to just tear off my neck. And like, you've got the, you've got the, um, the special effects guy. It was a guy called um, Russell Sharp who worked on The Hobbit. And um, he's like, you just can't tear it off. It's glued to your skin. You'll literally rip your skin off. And We found it pretty um, hilarious, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we had this really minotaur in my bedroom just yeah. freaking out. Like, and um, in, the so end, in the end, like, I'm like, can we put a DVD on for you just to calm me down or something? Like, just relax. And he just started watching <laughs> Chopper. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he went to the DVD library and just yeah he went to the DVD library and chose Chopper to calm yeah. him down. <laughs> so I was just a minotaur in the you know, warehouse watching Chopper. <laughs> and then they're kind of surreal moments of music videos that I just love. It's just it's nuts. I don't think you can divorce controversy from music video. Um, I mean, one of the things about music video from the very beginning of MTV was you need to create something that's going to create a stir and arguably be something that you would watch, want to watch again and again. Um, so obviously there's certain levels of controversy, um, but I think it's something that's a trademark of many videos and it's a challenge of, uh, and even now in the YouTube age, um, maybe even more so, like how do you, the idea is to create, you know, everyone wants the viral, uh, you know, hit, and I know there's pressure on filmmakers to deliver on that. And. I think that uh, what we perceive to be controversial can also change over time. So I think that if you look at some of the clips in Agent Provocateur, I, I think th there are some pieces there that looking at it now, uh, you know, compared to when it came out, it makes you sometimes wonder, why was it so controversial? Um, but I think that the reason why it is controversial is because you can't, th there's no kind of meeting point for all people to really agree on something that uh, the filmmaker is trying to express. And so they have to just be free to express their creative process in that way. And, um, you know, the, the, the reaction of, of the audience watching it, it's not gonna be the same. And it's never going to be, no matter what. I mean, you can get a general, Yes, we like the video, but sometimes it can trigger something. And even the most, I think, innocent videos could offend someone, and, and it makes others wonder, like, why? But in the controversial side, I think um, there are certain themes that could really trigger things. So we, we just kind of looked at politics and race and creed and hate and, you know, things like that, that or sex um, or uh, a certain belief structures that maybe you know could trigger these things and alexi while we didn't get an opportunity to see any of, any of the music videos you've made uh tonight on the big screen i mean what what do you feel is the difference between doing what we've done this evening and watching it on a laptop or a phone like how do you feel about that as a, as a maker well i think um ultimately the museum space is a public space and it's a communal experience and when you look at things on your laptop um, it's usually very sort of isolated, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, experience with 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 the clip that you're watching. So I think um, putting it out there in the public space and being able to um, process it and digest it in a group of people, I think it's it kind of opens it up to debate and um, uh, various opinions can can be expressed and. It's, it's interesting to see people's reactions. And I, and I think uh, I completely agree with Meg um, in terms of constantly changing bar, you know, the threshold of what people think is, is offensive or provocative is not, is not um, constant and it's not permanent. So I think th things are very, things that, that, are, that may be considered offensive, you know, 10 years ago are quite quite funny and not not taken so seriously anymore and some things are I think I think there's a difference in, in creating something that's intentionally offensive 
or designed to uh, to express you know sort of hateful ideas and something that actually is is an expression of personal um, attitudes or relationship to the to the track because we're talking about music videos right now this is not you know commercials which in TV commercials there's the the idea of censorship and self censorship is a lot more prevalent things are a lot more safe and mainstream and filtered down by a committee and me, the beauty of music video is that is that hopefully it's a it's an expression of a band a band's ideas and the director's ideas and it's not really about trying to placate people or make it a, make it a safe experience i think it's it's important to be pushing um, people's tolerance and, and uh, the levels of what's acceptable and i think music video music video genre uh, or uh, the uh, you know i think i think the directors of music video are actually on the forefront of that i would have to yeah. agree with you because um if you think about the music videos that started out that were controversial from years ago and you look at it now then it would be highly emulated by other people mm -hmm. then it becomes no longer controversial because you've seen too much of it and then you're like what's the big fuss because uh, oh that was so shocking and then you see it you see it, you see it you know kind of presented in many different ways and then it becomes less scandalous so that's mm -hmm. why it that that kind of bar for controversy i think is fluid always you know I'm going to leave the panel discussion with the idea of scandalousness because it seems right. Um, and I want to open it up to the audience because perhaps um, we've really just skimmed the surface here. So if does anybody in the crowd, I can come and bring a mic to perhaps. Um, oh, we have a roving mic over there. Um, uh, want to ask any specific questions of any of the any of the filmmakers here or curators here, or perhaps a more broad general question? Perhaps. Don't be shy. <laughs> hey, um, Darcy and Josh, I've got a question for you. Is that one on? Um, I'm just curious to know the process of that particular film clip, um, how you got those effects and how you pulled that off. Oh, there's a club beat one? Yes. Uh, I have no idea, so Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the entire clip three? was shot in one take. So it's using no multiple passes and it's not, it was shot on a steady cam on the back of a ute. And after that, we pretty much, well, I just pretty much sat in a dark room and did it <laughs> in After Effects <laughs> by rotoscoping out um, certain key poses and then tracking it back into the footage in 3D in reverse. So it would come into the shot before it's actually like really there. And then it was just kind of a process of distorting and manipulating it to make it look like it was really like close to the camera or further away from the lens or I don't know. Yeah, just to try and emulate parallax shift, Josh kind of would um, would map the rotoscope images and give them a kind of slight 3D kind of um, mm. nature to them. So you kind of almost build like half a 3D model and then texture map the image um, around that. So when the camera moves past, you have this slight parallax going on. So it didn't look like a cardboard cutout. Yeah. It was just kind of floating there in, in space. Yeah. And um, what else about the group? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, the actual choreography of it as well it was um shot at 50 frames a second but because of their uh lip syncing their song kind of in real time they had to sing it uh twice as fast as usual so the song was played back at like a minute 25 running length and they had to just run through each pose and try and get to the next kind of thing like i was just sitting on the back of the truck yelling out like you have to do this in five seconds and i was like go, go, go. <laughs> and they had to kind of jump off a box at that certain point and like the guy was getting really really tired and we did it 10 times in that day and that was the last take that we ended up using. So the guy was absolutely destroyed. Yeah, and in the, in the last <laughs> yeah. take as well, like he actually towards the end he started getting really puffed, yeah. and like his lip sync started falling out of out of out of time. So yeah. what Josh had to do was then mask um, the mouth out from a previous oh, wow. take, and then um, motion track it to his yeah. face in that take, which was I re lip synced mental. live footage, and it was the worst thing <laughs> ever done. <laughs> yeah, um, and we went through like hundreds of umbrellas. Uh, yeah, like we didn't thing. have a didn't have an umbrella left in the studio. Yeah, after every that. every take we destroyed like two umbrellas. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't. We didn't have the RSPCA. There's no umbrella thing. <coughs> um, yeah.
I can't think of anything else. Well, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Any more burning questions out there? I'm just really interested in the um, um, the filmmaker's interpretation of a song and then the artist's vision for their video and how do you meld the two and what starts first? Why don't you start, Chris? You've been a little quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I've been chilling. Um, it really is just a case-to-case a -case basis. Um, uh, sometimes you can have a really creative conversation with an artist who has a, a conceptual foundation, you know, like a message that they want to convey in their song, and uh, that can be inspiration for you. Uh, sometimes an artist will have an actual vision. They just want, you know, more or less like a gun for hire to, to execute it for them. Um, and that, that happens. I guess there's two kinds of artists. Mm. There's the ones that are, who, are, who are, are trusting, um, you know, they engage you for what you do. And then there's those who, you know, are so immersed in, in their work that they kind of just need to direct themselves. And I think that that's what's actually happening now, that budgets are, are diminishing. Artists are just, you know, when I say artists, I mean musicians are actually turning you know, to directing um, because it's easier to do uh, for, for very little. Um, I know I'm not really answering your question, <laughs> but uh, f for me, my personal take on it is I will think about the literal interpretation of the song and then I'll do more or less the opposite of that. So in a way, I'm kind of, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of do everything that is different from what everyone else is doing around me. And I hope that as a result, I'm making work that is unique. Um, but that's just me, you know. I'm sure the other directors have a different take on it. Um, yeah, I guess um, I, I do listen to the lyrics in the song and I do speak to the, to the guys in the band. And um, I think, yeah, I was sort of saying earlier, I think that um, uh, yeah, it's a definitely a case-by-case -case basis, but um, sometimes, uh, yeah, artists will come to you with a very strong aesthetic and they sort of want to continue their kind of thing and um, it is frustrating if you do come from a standpoint where you've got all these ideas and you see it sort of differently and um, I do find sometimes that there is um, um, fear from the artist about like how provocative they might want to be or or what messages they they might be putting out there, which um, but yeah, again, it's it's great when you you're able to work with someone who's really trusting and um, yeah. Um, I th I think um, for, for me personally, I, I listen to the song like a thousand times, and I'm not even. Kidding. I read that you listen to Easy Way Out eight hundred and forty times. Yeah, something ridiculous like that. that. Was an MSD one that was one thousand one hundred twenty nine. I think <laughs> like his iTunes play count. I, I really piss off everyone in the studio yeah. because like I just sit there and play this song on repeat the entire day, um, or perhaps sometimes multiple headphones, days. Headphones, headphones, does. Yeah, but I don't like that. I just like it, you know, bouncing <laughs> off the walls. And <laughs> you used to have dreadlocks in the headphones, so you didn't kind of fit on. Them. Yeah, yeah, that was the main reason. <laughs> 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 um, but for me, it's about kind of finding, I guess, a, um, the right mesh with the, the mood or tone of the song. Um, I, I tend not kind of focus on lyrics as much. Um, and a lot of the time, the, the conceptualisa conceptualization is, um, is somewhat selfish. We, we approach it um, from the perspective of what do we want to really do here? Like, what are some cool ideas we've been playing with or been really having, having this burning desire to create or, or play with? So um, JT, the club, feats, the club Feet clip was a perfect example of that. Yeah, just um, an idea that I wanted to trial out and it just came along like they came along with the budget so I just wanted to do it. Yeah, and yeah. then the, the Wax Tail Allo Black clip we did was just kind of a desire to have an octopus swimming through real streets. Um, and that was, we pitched it to him and he liked it, so that was, that was it. Yeah, know? so I'd say we banned ideas for clips as opposed to like yeah, making probably them right. for the, the song, <laughs> yeah. Um, the interactive section of the exhibition is a really important part and maybe Jonathan and or Meg, if you want to speak a little bit about the way that those clips perhaps sit in sort of adjacent to 
the kind of way of making music videos uh, that we're discussing on the right hand side of the panel here. And one of the things we want to do with the exhibition was really to establish that uh, some people felt that music videos in the late 90s, that, that when MTV stopped playing them, that music videos were dead. And in fact, with the emergence of YouTube as, as a distribution avenue, I, we argue that more people are watching music videos than ever. And I think what's been interesting is, is creators now taking, if people are looking at music videos primarily on the computer, why not use the computer in an interesting way rather than just a straight linear clip? So in the exhibition we have some really groundbreaking works um, that all happen to be made for the band Arcade Fire. Um, in 2007, Vincent Morissette made the arguably the first interactive music video, Neon Bible. Um, and Chris Milk made a very celebrated work called Wilderness Downtown that's also in the exhibition. But another aspect of interactivity that we explored in the exhibition was not just the idea that you could change the image on your computer or, or, um, or whatnot, but also the idea that in the remix section, there's another form of interactivity, which is actually the fan as, as kind of a creator or co-creator of a video and changing the dynamic of just a, a, a viewer watching a video on their TV to where maybe they're downloading the video and remixing it in various ways, whether it's recreating the, the Beyonce single ladies dance or doing an EBN style kind of video sampling or eclectic method style of remix or in one case, Dustin McLean, he's a really amazing artist from San Francisco, created what's known as the literal video, where he's re-recorded re the vocal tracks on different videos in this, and it sounds just like the singer, and he and they basically are singing about what the ridiculous things that are on the screen. Um, so that that's a you know a different kind of form of interactivity, but um, it's really exciting that that that's a you know, and I think initially record labels were shutting these things down. All these artists were getting cease and desist, but what they realized is they could actually, when people are making all these Beyonce dance videos, it's promoting the artist, and so they realized they could add a little link to to sell that record, and now, in many cases, they're not shutting them down, so. I think we had a question up the back, too, yeah. Thank you. Um, with music, uh, people say that there's no original music anymore. Everything's a copy of something else before. Everyone's derivative of something else before. Do you find the same thing with videos? I know um, the Club Feet video was copied uh, once and possibly even twice, not long about after. About like ten times. Six or seven times. <laughs> oh, there you go. So uh, how many times, I mean, it's happened you know, to you guys plenty of times. Has that happened to anyone else? And how many times have you yourselves gone and looked at a video and gone, oh, I really like that thing. I might kind of infuse that into uh, a video I'm doing next. Well, this is a copy of a panel, so we... <laughs> um, well, I shouldn't try these jokes out. Got to have a rehearsal sometime. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah, as a curator, when we were looking at, vi you know, at, at different music videos, it's, it's, it becomes very evident some of the work that is is somewhat derivative of others. But, you know, in the same respect, I think sometimes you need to look at the context of what the filmmaker is doing to really understand if they were inspired by the original idea of someone who had done it before um, or if they're just really copying it. And um, is there an original music? I mean, to answer your question, like, does it feel like there's not really an original music video? Um, no, I don't agree with that. I mean, watch, I mean, just go see Spectacle and you'll see that um, even when you're using a similar technique or process, you can still define yourself differently by the way that you execute your idea. So just because you're an illustrator doesn't mean that um, that technique is limited to just one, you know, filmmaking style. So um, the clip that you saw of... Um, the Polish clip from Kajak Adamski, um, Katachi. Jonathan and I were really moved by that because that, that's one where the song is Japanese and initially we thought, oh, is that a Japanese animation uh, style, uh, uh, you know, 
clip, but it wasn't. And it was from these this this collective in Poland, and they kind of used the Japanese animation style, but made it very crafty and their own, and and told a narrative the way that they you know they use that. So, I think that. Um, while that you can't avoid people being inspired by other people's work and maybe might try that in their own work, I think that you, you need to look at the intention of what it is that they're trying to do. And if it's copy, like the literal videos in a way are a copy of the, the unique video, but then here's this, this filmmaker, you know, making it humorous and funny and just changing the context. And as a filmmaker too, when you put together a treatment, I mean, you're always using references. You're always kind of saying it's kind of a blend of this and this. Um, and that helps you sell the clip. You can't do it otherwise. Um, it's also kind of dangerous, though, because you're placing an expectation in your mm. client's mind <laughs> that what you're going to deliver is these things that aren't your work. But you also know? tell the truth, because sometimes the client will reference a video and, and try to challenge a filmmaker to say, I want you to do it exactly like this. You know, and yeah. I feel bad for filmmakers because... Yeah, totally. You know, they're saying, well, we don't want to copy that guy, but you're still married to that Yeah, it's idea. like, we really like Michelle Gondry, but we can't afford him. Can yeah. you do a Michelle Gondry-esque video for us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like Lucy's story a lot, how she, you know, had this budget for two days and it got whittled down and her idea had to just take shape, you know, like how she had to get super creative and have that take shape and end up with what she ended up with. And then, you know, she's having to discover like avid renters, yeah. you know, like right Yeah, you, there's always um, solutions to the problem that yeah. differently from how you see it and it's constantly sort of changing and evolving. But um, yeah, I, I recently had um, a couple of my friends who worked on the Alpine clip um, call me and just like, oh, there's someone locally who's sort of like ripping you off. Um, with a clip that they made which was about a cult of people in a house and it had all the very similar um, aesthetics and yeah, look to it. I didn't know about you before I did that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and I said, you know, it's, I guess it's like flattering, I guess, um, that someone does that. But is it an aesthetic an idea or is that just an aesthetic? And it, it sort of like was about like similar, like a group of people in a house. Um, Josh did visual effects on that. <laughs> oh, really? Sorry. Sorry. It was just for the money. Um, and then another time, like I, I was speaking just recently, um, was this, in concept. this <laughs> British um, video commissioner, she contacted me about trying to get me some clips and she and, she and a couple other people had said that they thought that the Alpine Hands and even the Nick Knight thing might have influenced the Miley Cyrus videos recently, the ones where she's in wow. a house. <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but th and I was like, yeah, whatever. If that's happening, that's kind of cool. But she's, she's licking uh, an axe. An axe? Yeah, yeah right. that was Terry Richardson. And then the one before it, she's in a house. It's more Tumblr than, I mean, mine, I, you know, I feel like mine's more, like, has an idea there and there several ideas in there. And, but hers is sort of like just a very similar aesthetic and um, in a house which is all very cream and pastel and they're all with like, you know, there's even things with chicken and stuff. Like I had the chicken in the shower <coughs> and I was chicken like... Chicken is yours. It's mine. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I, that's my thing. Um, in, yeah, but I'm yeah, constantly changing and, um, you know, like I just... You just got to keep... Yeah, because I, I don't want... I, I mean, I really like... Um, yeah, no, I don't want to repeat myself either. So, like, I like to change and, you know, it's dependent on the song and the mood of the song. and Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, it, it happens. And, and you can't help but be inspired by amazing stuff. Like, it just sort of seeps into your brain, you know, so if it's really, really good. And But, you, yeah, you got to make it your own too, I think. Like, the best stuff is when it's more, it comes from a personal sort of place, I think. But Yeah, there's there's a few kinds of thoughts about how to create something. Um, you know, if you're just starting out, you know, there's the like, you know, sort of fake it till you make it kind of approach, which is, you know, find someone's style that you're really impressed by and then try and make something that looks like they could have made it themselves in a way. But then the idea is that, you know, the amount, like the magnitude of work that you produce, over time you start to develop a style of your own because, you, you start to kind of self-reference, you know. I, I didn't really, um, you know, subscribe to that approach. My first video was like, you know, just a demonstration of all the skills that I had, you know. It was more or less a reel. 
I did a presets uh, you the one video in like late 2005 and it just showed every single thing that I could possibly do which was like you know a few things and um, and and then so from that point on you know the videos that I did from that was kind of like you know a, an extrapolation of something that I did from presets my people you know um, sorry the are you the one video um, but I'd also like to even hear, Alex, what do you think? Because you've been doing this a while and, you know. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, Chris brought up self-referencing and, and, you know, the, the idea of sort of repeating recurrent, the recurrent motifs that are happening over and over and you see things over and over. There are certain cliches and there's a reason why they work and there's a reason why the artists and um, viewers sort of gravitate towards certain things, so I think it's it's easy to forget that what 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 we do as directors is very competitive and mm. stressful. It's not it's not like you know imagining a fine artist who is sitting in a studio and working on a body of work that they just want to produce. I mean, this is very this is still a collaborative and client based process. Right, mm. like this is the really, tr really the truth of this. You know, it's not really whatever whatever comes to mind. You have to. How many rejected treatments do you guys can think of? You know, it's not the first first idea that gets chosen, and you don't get to do everything that you set out to do. Right. Yeah. So yeah. When I, you when have I to work within constraints. Totally. So. Well, when I no. first started out, like you know, I did the traditional treatment writing process, and it usually comes. The opportunity comes through from a video commissioner uh, outside of Australia when the industry is a lot bigger and expansive than it is here. Um, they're approaching you along with 10 to 20 other directors and, you know, they're going to look through, they're going to sift through all the ideas, you know, like treatments range between a sentence if you're, um, you know, like a high-end director to like... 20 to 40 pages if you're like starting out and super earnest you know so they have to like find their best one mm. recommend that to the artist because the artist doesn't want to sit through like you know thousands of pages of documentation you know they're too busy on being on tour or whatever um, so uh, I found it really um, frustrating uh, to spend two or three days just like full days really immersing myself into an idea and getting my heart to attached to it and then you know imagine <laughs> that like it's being folded into a paper airplane and mm -hmm. thrown across the office you know so uh, you know luckily I, I guess i feel like i'm at a point in my career now where i don't write treatments and if an artist approaches me i kind of screen them i just say like you know i only single bid um and you know if they're committed to that, um, then we can make something awesome. Like uh, last week, I turned down Yoko Ono and Sean Lennon because they were doing a, a blanket call out. And last year, I turned down Kelly Rowland. <laughs> you know, even though they had two hundred thousand dollars, it was just like, um, in my mind, not worth my time. And you run the risk, I think, if you do such the treatment that. It, your idea will get incorporated if they like it, it even if you don't get selected which happens yeah. too so mm. and you can't control that you know you can put like a little copyright on your treatment but you know yeah like you're going to take work. them to court <laughs> you know what i mean like you're going to take you sony to court you didn't choose mine and i saw it on screen yeah, yeah. they're going to be like prove it yeah. We had that idea before you, or whatever. Right. Yeah. We're, we've had that happen. So when we put treatments together, and you know, they, they haven't been the most kind of um, individualized. They're quite blanket, quite generic, in some yeah. some of the terminology used. But um, we've had commissioners in LA who have just kind of gone, really like that idea. I'm just gonna, just just gonna take it. that aspect of it and <laughs> change the setting a little bit. Yeah. So instead of it being in the desert, it's now yeah. a mansion. And yeah. that happened to us twice. And then when we're in LA. They, they wanted to rip off the club feet video. They just want me to make it again. <laughs> yeah, and we didn't really want to do that. Yeah. Um, we're probably the opposite of Chris. We like write treatments all day more than we make videos. We write so many treatments. Don't like, you find it like it sort of it damages you somehow? Yeah. Damages yeah, it's your really, creative really, spirit really in good. some way? No, I think, I think it depends anything, it's the though because um, I would have to say that Jonathan was commissioning this video back in the day and 
was it was it Alex Martin who did that really beautiful treatment? And he, like, I remember Jonathan had sent the email and it came back five minutes later. So I knew that he had been writing this dream, but he had whittled it down to one page. And it was so dramatic the way that the narrative unfolded, you know, the way that he described it. And <coughs> you just wanted to hire him because he had thought it out so well, you know, just from the way he shot it and how he imagined it. And, and he articulated it so well in this one paragraph. Mm. And I think he had gotten it down. So sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're a very good uh, writer and you can articulate your idea in the, into that one way, and, and it was also process driven. It was a process-driven treatment, so it was easy to know, like, this is how I'm going to shoot it. You know, the camera's going this way, and then, you know, the story unfolds this way. So, yeah. Yeah, for me, I mean, running treatments is just kind of a, a, a – you're just really honing your skills. You're, you're honing your creativity. Mm. And instead of killing your creativity, I think it's kind of it's doing the opposite. It's kind of really kind of making this mean machine. You're mm. well-refined and kind of – you get your kind yeah. of practices kind of really locked down. You become better at, at creating ideas and become better at conceptualizing faster. I actually um, I encourage everyone to – look at um, Michelle Gondry's illustration for the visual palindrome for Chibo Motto because it's a one page kind of treatment but mm. drawn. Mm. It also helps <laughs> establish color. what you want to make as well yeah. because you don't exactly know what you want to make for sure like when you start it but it also helps you define what it is mm. that you're making specifically like yeah, in and terms I, of images and you know, narrative. Yeah and I, I find I don't really I feel like I'm kind of um, almost duping the artist if I don't have this kind of concept fully locked down I, mean, I want to mm. I want to approach an artist with an idea that is absolutely solid it's like locked down the narrative is perfect the idea is fully fleshed out I don't want to kind of yeah. I feel unprofessional if I'm kind of going to them with a couple of sentences and going like it just doesn't feel like yeah. my, my heart's invested into it and I want them to kind of go on the flip side of that go read this email and go like this guy loves the shit out of our song mm. he's got a great idea for it and he's passionate about it and that's kind of what I want to convey to anyone that I want to work with gets kind of trying we'll, we'll like we'll not have any ideas for an entire night we'll just we won't go to bed we'll just kind of like stand there and like throw <laughs> stuff at each other and drink all red bull and all night and stuff i don't know i guess then, we can yeah. establish that there are two sides of the same <laughs> coin <laughs> yeah. i'll tell you an experience i had with franz ferdinand on a video that got shelved um i had written a treatment and i had supplied relevant reference material um uh, it was like, you know, a, a trip, a, an acid trip experience. Uh, there was a, a totem pole element and I sent through, you know, what I thought was a good example of that which ha does not exist, you know, with existing material, okay? And, um, and I kind of, you know, I guess I was um, under the impression that, you know, these guys, they all went to art school uh, before they were musicians and, and they would have been able to see the, the separation between someone else's work and what you produce for them, which is your own thing, right? Um, but when I'd finished the video, I sent it to them, you know, they were not willing to um, give us the, the second 50% of the budget. Uh, it was a 60,000 pound video that we worked on for four months. Um, super high end, you know, lots of like groundbreaking visual effects uh, because they don't believe that I delivered exactly what was on the treatment. And I did. That also goes both ways though as well, I will say. I mean, and, and I completely understand that, but like we, we did a, um, a clip for a, a Disney artist that we won't mention. Um, <laughs> we sold our souls for $100,000. Um, but at the time we were just like, well, let's get some cash. Yeah. Um, and because um, you don't really come across it that often in music video clip land, it's, it's hard to get by. But anyway, we did, we did this clip for, a, a, um, for, a, for a Disney artist and what actually saved us in the end, it was, it was also shelved, but the, what actually saved us is Disney couldn't sue us because we'd kind of adhered to the treatment so mm. stringently. So we went back, well, we said that in the treatment, we told you we're going to do that. And then, yeah, yeah. So we actually kind of, you know. Oh, well, I had, that, I had the exact same experience. Yeah. 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 We, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't, they they couldn't withhold the money, but yeah. they they certainly withheld the video. And the the actual um, issue that was at hand was they when they initially came to me, they didn't want to be known as the band wearing the suits like the hives. Mm -hmm. And so uh, part of the concept was they shred themselves, you know, of their Dior arm suits, uh, and kind of had this sort of tribal vibe. And it was at at the, the at the the point where um 
in music video history, like MGMT just came out and there was like this kind of, you know, vague kind of tribal kind of thing mm. happening in the landscape of music videos. So it was right on the edge of that. And, um, and the video that they released instead had them wearing suits. <laughs> To suit or not to Always. suit? Yeah. <laughs> I will um, suit you. <laughs> I, um, I'm getting some wrap-up signals uh, here, and uh, so I have to thank you for coming to tonight's um, panel and flux screening. Uh, thank you, Jonathan and Meg, Alexi, Chris, Darcy, Josh, and Lucy. Um, and we hope that if you haven't already been to see the exhibition, you will. It is on until the 23rd of February. Uh, and if you have been, please go again. Uh, and thank you so much. <laughs>